Now, I want to talk about another trend. Uh, historically, we've funded our highways, and in fact, almost all federal surface transportation funding has come from a gas tax. My home state of Oregon was the first state to pass a gas tax in 1919 and dedicate it to highways. By 1930, all 48 states had dedicated their gas taxes to highways. 1956, the federal government dedicated federal gas taxes to highways. The problem with gas taxes is uh, they work when it's not very, not much congestion, when there's not uh, a lot of crowds, but when it starts getting congested, uh, gas taxes don't work very well. Tolls work a little better because you can charge a toll, a higher toll during rush hour than other times of the day. The problem with tolls is the collection costs are so high when you have to have someone out there with their hand out at every toll booth. So in 1956, Congress decided to go with gas taxes rather than tolls. Today, we have electronic toll systems that are totally electronic. You have a transponder in your car, and as you drive under it, it ticks off that you've consumed that much money, and it, you know, charges it to your account or ticks it off your, your preloaded account, and if you don't have a transponder, it photographs your license plate and sends you a bill. Totally electronic. The collection costs are a lot lower than having somebody <coughs> with their hand out. Uh, still a little bit <coughs> higher than, than gas taxes, but still uh, it makes it a lot more efficient. So we can have a different kind of, of user fee based on uh, when and where people drive rather than based on gas taxes. And this is important because gas taxes are disappearing as a viable source of revenue. As cars get more fuel efficient, gas taxes are getting lower and lower. When you fill up your tank at the gas station, the amount you pay in tax is only half as much as the amount your parents paid in 1960 for every mile you drive uh, because cars are so much more fuel efficient. So my home state of Oregon is again pioneering. They have developed a system of charging based on the miles you drive and where you drive and potentially when you drive rather than based on how much gas you buy. And the way this system works, and it's, it's keyed to petroleum powered vehicles, but we can design it for uh, electric vehicles as well. And in fact, the state is right now considering legislation to include electric vehicles in it. Uh, you have a GPS on board your car. The GPS tracks where you go. When you go on a county highway, the, the miles you drive on that highway would go to the county. When you go on a city street, the miles you drive would go on the city. When you go on a state highway, the miles you drive would go to the state. When you drive up to a gas station, the gasoline pump has an electronic device in it. When it gets inserted in your gas tank, it communicates with the GPS. And the only thing the GPS tells it is how much money you owe. It doesn't tell it where you went or when you went there. Your privacy is, privacy is totally assured. It only tells it how much money you owe, and it might break it down by the type of road you went on, city, state, or county, whatever. Uh, as you can see in this particular one, it shows uh, uh, your gas tax would have been $4.68, but because of your miles you drove, it was $5.12. So it deducts the gas tax and adds the mile fee to get your total. So it actually is a transitional system. They can use the gas tax or they can go to the vehicle mile fee, and the two are compatible side by side. Uh, so as people get new cars, we can switch to the vehicle mile fee and have this uh, technology incorporated into their cars. Uh, so that's the new trend. That's the kind of way that we're going to pay for our highways in the future, and I think that has to be recognized. Now what about dealing with congestion, dealing with crumbling infrastructure, and so on and so forth? Uh, there's actually, it turns out, there's some very low cost things that are going to uh, greatly improve our transportation system, in particular automotive and highways. First of all, the most cost effective thing any city can do to reduce congestion is traffic signal coordination. I say this over and over again, and yet I see cities across the country with 75% of their traffic signals uncoordinated saying, we're going to go out and spend a billion dollars on light rail, when that billion dollars is going to do less to relieve congestion than spending uh, $50 million on traffic signal coordination, and they don't leave that unfunded because they don't have any money for it. The next thing is cars are becoming smarter all the time. 
You can buy cars today that have what's called adaptive cruise control. They measure the distance to the car in front of you and maintain a fixed distance. They'll break if you get too close. And if you just set it on adaptive cruise control, it'll keep that fixed distance. When 20% of the cars on the road are using adaptive cruise control, about half of all our congestion is going to go away. Because a lot of congestion is just related to slow human reaction times. And the computers, being much faster, won't have that slower reaction time. You can buy cars today that not only have adaptive cruise control, they watch for the stripes on the road and steer between the stripes. That's called lane keep. And they watch other cars on the road. And if a car starts veering into your lane because they, you're in their blind spot, your car will break or accelerate or swerve or whatever it takes to avoid a collision. You can buy those three features today on a Toyota Prius or a Lexus or a Mercedes, lots of different cars. Uh, the cheapest one I know is the Prius. The top of the line Prius has those three features for about $30,000. Uh, the actual technology is very cheap, but they, the, as any technology, the car manufacturers start out with their high-end cars and let it work down. Not because the technology is expensive, but because they're trying to make uh, you know, the, the bucks from the people who will buy everything uh, from the very start. Once you have those three technologies, adaptive <laughs> cruise control and uh, 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 vehicle collision avoidance and uh, lane keep, you add that, you tie that into your GPS system, and you have a driverless car. People today are driving in cars that are 90% driverless. Tr basically, turning them into a full driverless car is nothing more than a software upgrade. And driverless cars sound like science fiction, but they're not. Um, let me turn off this audio. Um, Sebastian Thrun is a German researcher at Stanford University. Uh, he was hired by Volkswagen to, to put this together, but other companies have contributed. Uh, Google has uh, driven driverless cars around California 140,000 miles. The cars can deal with stoplights. They can deal with pedestrians. They can deal with other cars. Uh, the only accident they had in that 140,000 miles was somebody who rear-ended them at a stoplight. <laughs> <laughs> One accident. So uh, the driverless technology is available. It's not science fiction. The main obstacles are bureaucratic and institutional. If we can remove those obstacles, uh, we will have driverless cars on the market in two or three years. Our automotive uh, automobile fleet turns over every 18 years. So by 2025, 2030, <coughs> most cars on the road will be driverless, uh, and that'll have a huge increase in, in mobility. You won't have to be 16 years old and able-bodied to drive. You can drive if you're nine years old. You can drive if you're 90 years old. People can, uh, my 85-year-old parents will be able to stay in their home longer if they have a driverless car than if, uh, if they have to uh, uh, rely on somebody else. Here's a typical sensor. Uh, those are laser sensors to uh, observe what's going on around the car. Uh, here's a driverless valet parking car that uh, Volkswagen has developed. Basically, you go up to a restaurant, you uh, uh, get out of your car, and you say, car, go find a parking place and park yourself. So it drives around until it <laughs> finds a parking place, an empty parking place, and then it parks. And then uh, you get done eating, and you come out of your restaurant, pull out your iPhone, and you say, car, come. And the car starts up and drives out and comes and picks you up. And uh, this technology is avail it's not available for sale today, but it is available today. And basically, we need to change some state laws to make it possible for that to work. So uh, in conclusion, the four trends that I want you to think about as we think about reauthorization is that it's important to move back to funding transportation out of user fees and less out of uh, taxes and subsidies. Second, it's important to give states incentives to be cost effective. And one way to do that is to focus on formula grants rather than uh, competitive uh, or discretionary grants. Third, uh, look towards replacing gas taxes. It's not going to happen in this reauthorization, but look towards replacing gas taxes with vehicle mile fees in the next few years. And finally, 
look towards driverless cars as a technology that uh, will increasingly be available and we we need to figure out how to remove those uh, institutional and bureaucratic barriers to make it happen. Thank you very much.